Greetings and welcome to Beginning and End with Ryan Peterson. I am your host, Ryan Peterson, author of Judgment of the Nephilim, the comprehensive biblical study of Genesis 6, the Nephilim giants, the fallen angels, and everything that took place in the days of Noah, as well as the author of the forthcoming, the final Nephilim, which goes from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, unraveling the mysteries of the apocalypse as we examine the return of the sons of God, the fallen angels, and the culmination of the final battle between the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, and the seed of the serpent, the Antichrist, all to come in September. The final Nephilim is coming soon, and this is part two of our final Nephilim series. And we are going to look at the Assyrian, the angel who ruled the pre-flood world. And so I'm often asked about this chapter. I devoted a chapter to discussing this fallen angel, and I received many, many questions about Ezekiel chapter 31, which I think is one of the most mysterious chapters in the Bible. In fact, I received an email from a pastor today, this morning, asking about this particular topic. So uh, he'll be very happy to know that this show is coming out and answering his question. So the first thing I want to clarify is that the Assyrian is a different angel from Satan. This is not the devil. And we're going to establish that biblically, of course, but to In order to understand the context so we can make sure we let scripture define scripture to properly and rightly divide the word, I want to explain esoteric passages, what I call esoteric passages in scripture. And so these are chapters or sections of scripture where God is addressing either a king or a prince or someone of high stature. But the passage is really directed to a fallen angel. And so the most popular example of this, of course, is found in Isaiah 14, the very famous passage that discusses, uh, starting in verse 12, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how thou, art, how thou art fallen, and gets into the aspirations of the devil to sit on the throne of God, above the stars of God, to set his throne and his place upon the holy mountain to be like the Most High. And of course, again, that's in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. And this is where, of course, these characteristics, although the passage is addressed to the king of Babylon, that's who it's addressed to, it's really directed at the devil, the true meaning of it. And we can see that the characteristics in the passage can only be ascribed to a fallen angel as opposed to a human being, a normal mortal human. And so that's what I call an esoteric passage. The second most commonly known esoteric passage is found in Ezekiel chapter 28, where again, we find a passage that this time is addressed to the king of Tyre. But God and everything he's saying about this king is clearly not referring to a normal human being. When we look at just some of the traits that God ascribes to this ruler, it says that he sealeth up the sum full of wisdom and beauty. And the key phrase that we see is that it says, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So right there, we know this is not talking about a normal mortal human being. It's actually, again, referring to the devil. And then it goes on to describe the jewels that were on his breastplate. And those jewels, the carbuncle, the sapphire, and those those nine jewels listed, those are all the same jewels that were carried on the breastplate of Aaron, the high priest, when the tabernacle was being constructed. So this is addressing Satan in his pre-rebellious state, when he was still a righteous angel. So we see how these passages work, and it discusses his rise, his fall, his sin of pride, and how God would ultimately judge him. And so again, when we're looking at these passages, the key thing to see here is that God can use a human proxy and address it to a king, but really is directing it at a fallen angel. And so what we see in this passage is it goes on to say that He was in the holy mountain of God. He walked up and down the stones of fire. Again, these are things only an angel who has heavenly realm access could do. And in Judgment of the Nephilim, I explain in detail what those stones of fire are and what their purpose was in heaven and still today. And so, and then it closes by saying that, This being was perfect in his ways until iniquity was found in thee. So again, we're seeing that this is referring to the devil in his good state when he still serves God. 
before his rebellion. Well, there is another esoteric passage in the Bible, and that's what we're going to discuss today when we look at this other fallen angel who's named the Assyrian. And we find these two chapters actually also in the book of Ezekiel, in chapters 31 and in Ezekiel chapter 32. And these are an esoteric address to the Assyrian. So who was this being? Who was the Assyrian? So as we will see in this study, he was the preeminent angel among the Genesis 6 rebels. And of course, in Judgment of the Nephilim, that in my first book, that's where I established the biblical case for the Nephilim. I make it clear by going by scripture to interpret scripture that when we look at Genesis 6, particularly Genesis 6 verse 4, where it says that there were giants, Nephilim in Hebrew, in those days and after that, when the sons of God, the Benaiha Elohim, Fallen angels went in unto the daughters of men and took wives of which all they chose. And these women, because of this illicit fornication, this violation of God's genetic order of angels entering the human realm and taking human women as wives, the, their offspring were the Nephilim, hybrid, fallen, angelic, human hybrids who overran the world with violence and corrupted human genetics. And so this was the reason. This is what necessitated the flood. This is why God chose Noah, who was not only righteous, but he was perfect in his generations. And the Hebrew word there, tamim, refers to physical perfection. So we know Noah was not morally perfect. You can just go a few chapters later when he gets drunk and we see that's not the case. But he was perfectly human. His lineage was still fully human, which is why he and his sons were selected to restart and reboot the human population after the flood. So this is what took place and what Judgment of the Nephilim establishes and shows that this was the common understanding in the church for millennia and even in, even in the post-exilic Hebrew era as well. So now we get to the Assyrian. This was the angel. He was the chief of all the angels, the faction of the fallen angels who chose to do this sin of fornication. He was the preeminent figure and ruled over basically an empire that was part of fallen angel, part of Nephilim giants, and dominating humanity, all in an effort to corrupt the human race and prevent the prophesied birth of the Messiah, which God proclaimed to the devil in Genesis chapter 315. Now, when you look at Ezekiel chapter 31, again, you'll see that it's addressed to the Pharaoh of Egypt, and it refers to this being as the Assyrian, but on a close examination, we can see this is definitely not a normal human being in view. So the first thing we see in Ezekiel 31, just starting at verse 1, is that it says, Speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. And it says, Who art thou like in thy greatness? And it says, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches, and speaks in this illustrative language, in this metaphorical language, of this fallen angel as being a cedar of Lebanon. Now that's very important because this example of the Lebanese cedar is used metaphorically in other places of scripture. And when we study them, we'll find some interesting connections. The first thing we see is a reference in Amos chapter two. This is God talking about his victory over the two Nephilim kings, Og and Sihon, whose kingdoms were east of the Jordan River in the book of Numbers when Moses led the Israelites to fight them. Now, I call them in judgment of the Nephilim the gatekeepers of the promised land. So when so the Israelites conquered these kings, and we're told that King Og's bedstead was 13 feet long, his bed. And this is what God says about them in Amos 2. He says, yet I destroyed the Amorites before them, whose height was like the height of the cedar. And so God, again, God, this is God speaking, is comparing these Nephilim giants to the Lebanese cedar and declaring how great a victory it was. There's another passage we find, a prophecy of the end times in the book of Isaiah, where God is now speaking about restoring order in the world bringing goodness and justice and righteousness at the second coming of Christ, which the final Nephilim focuses on, the final battle between good and evil when Christ will battle the Antichrist 
and the, and Satan and the false prophet and all their armies. And it's very interesting that God says that at that time, there'll be peace in the land. There'll be righteousness. The land will flow with milk and honey. God will teach us his ways. His, his law shall go forth out of Zion. And then we're told something else. We're told about who he's going to judge, that God's judgment will come down upon all who are arrogant, who are prideful, and upon the cedars of Lebanon. So remember, just like in the Exodus, in the Exodus, God judged Pharaoh and the Egyptian armies, but it also says in the book of Exodus that God was going to judge their gods, that he was directly punishing the fallen angels and demons who the ancient Egyptians worshipped. Well, and when we look in the days of Noah, the angels were punished. The book of Jude tells us in verses 6 and 7 that the angels who committed this sin, going after strange flesh for fornication, were taken down to the abyss and put under chains of darkness until the judgment of the great day. It's where they remain that day. So we see that judgment took place and it will take place again as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And the book of Isaiah, as it continues to talk about this, this judgment, it says it upon all the cedars of Lebanon and all that are high and lifted up and upon the oaks of Bashan. So, of course, Og, King Og, Bashan, was his kingdom. So we see this connection spiritually through time, even prophetically, saying that the cedars of Lebanon, these, these aren't trees who are being punished. These are, this is metaphorical language for the fallen angels and the oaks of Bashan, their Nephilim offspring. Amazing, amazing comparisons. One other example we see of this, this use of a tree as an illustration for a king or a powerful angel is found in the book of Daniel in Daniel chapter 4. And there, of course, we have King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who was a global ruler and in many ways foreshadows the Antichrist, but he had a dream. He had a dream of a giant tree that had mighty branches that almost stretched to the heavens and had animals and birds in it, and that the watcher angels made a proclamation to cut the tree down. Now, of course, the watchers were the angels the book of Enoch identifies as the Genesis 6 fornicating angels. And it says, this is by decree of the watchers, cut the tree down. So King Nebuchadnezzar is disturbed by this dream. He doesn't know what it means. And he calls on all his occult practitioners, the Chaldeans, the magicians to interpret it for him. And of course they can't provide the interpretation. So he calls on the prophet Daniel and says, what does this dream mean? And when Daniel, of course, prays to God, the true God, Yahweh, the God of gods who rules over all these fallen angels and demons and principalities, he says that the tree in the dream, King, was you. That the tree itself symbolized Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, when we look at the punishment of Nebuchadnezzar that he received, then we see the spiritual connection is made plain. Because, of course, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel warned him, the dream was a warning for Nebuchadnezzar to repent, to not boast himself against God, to be merciful to his people, kind to the poor. And he said, if you repent, you can put off the judgment of God. Well, Nebuchadnezzar did none of those things. In fact, he boasted that he built his own kingdom. And look at his judgment in Daniel 4. He was turned into a human-animal hybrid. He grew claws. He grew feathers. He ate food outside and lived outside like an animal. He was a hybrid being for seven years, half man, half beast. And of course, in the end times, we'll see the Antichrist, who is called the beast in Revelation 13, but he has the number of a man. He's a hybrid. He is the hybrid. He is the final Nephilim. So this is all a foreshadow through time of what will take place in the book of Revelation. And it even says that let his heart, referring to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4 in verse 16, let his heart be changed from a man's to a beast. And in Revelation 13, you see that same interplay. It goes back and forth, referring to the Antichrist. On one hand, he's a man. On the other hand, he's called the beast. So just amazing, amazing prophetic imagery to drive home this symbolism of the tree representing either a king or a fallen angel. So continuing in Ezekiel, when we get to just verse 4 and verse 5, it speaks about, again, 
the Assyrian being this tree, the waters making him great, and that he was exalted above all the other trees of the field because of his power and his might. And again, this is all speaking about the expansion and the extension and the might of his empire. And as we move on through the passage to verse 6 and verse 7, this is where the esoteric aspect of this passage becomes plain. As we get to verse 6 and 7, it says that all the fowls, the birds, made their nest in his branches. And it says, under his branches were all the great nations. So all nations were under his rulership. So this is speaking about a fallen angel who ruled over the entire world, an empire. And then when we get to verse 7, it says, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. It said the fir trees were not like his boughs and said that the other trees in the garden, it says there were not any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. And this is where we now see the transition that this isn't talking about a normal human being because now we see a reference to the garden of Eden, the garden of God. And it says none of the other trees, meaning none of the other fallen angels could match the power, the beauty, the divine light of this angel, the Assyrian. So this establishes clearly that he is the preeminent angel of the antediluvian era. So you see, once we start looking at the small details in scripture, how quickly it is to identify that this is a passage just like Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. In fact, Ezekiel chapter 31 makes more references to the Garden of Eden than any other chapter in the Bible, including the early chapters of Genesis. So now we've established that there's a fallen angel in view, and we understand the context, and we see that this angel, the Assyrian, ruled over this empire in the days of Noah. But like King Nebuchadnezzar, like many other prideful angels or kings or emperors before him, he fell into judgment. And God says he delivered him to be destroyed for his pride to the mighty one of the heathen. He was turned over to Satan to be judged and destroyed by Satan and have his kingdom be crumble. And now that might seem odd, like why would the devil punish another fallen angel or, or someone be delivered to him? But we actually see other examples of this in scripture. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul identifies two uh, disciples who were in sin. Hymenaeus and Alexander and says, I have delivered them unto Satan to punish them. And then again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul makes a reference to saying to the church, saying, hey, if you have someone who's just committing unrepentant, rampant sin in the church, deliver them to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. And so, so we see two examples of this. And that why, would, why would Satan do this? Because the devil will destroy anyone. The devil has no loyalty to anyone but himself. And so this same deliverance to the devil for destruction took place to, with this angel in the ancient world before the flood. Continuing in Ezekiel 31, and we're just doing an overview, a survey, verse by verse. If you, this is all being done verse by verse. You'll find this. The Bible, so the Bible, the, the context is very clear and easy to follow here. As you get down to verses 12 to 13, it talks about the strangers, the terrible of nations have cut him off. And that basically all those who envied him betrayed him and attacked him. So the, the world right before the flood was in a world war. And this is the testimony of scripture. When you go back to Genesis 6, God says that all flesh had corrupted itself and the earth was full of violence. So this was a world war. Now these angels who once were loyal to the Assyrian and their Nephilim giant offspring were turning against him and battling his kingdom in world war leading right before the days of the flood judgment, which was, which was going to wipe them all out. And there's another interesting passage here where it says, God says that he did this to the end that no other tree would ever try to exalt themselves in this fashion. In other words, this was a deterrent to prevent this fallen angelic human fornication from ever taking place again. And this is why when you look in the biblical account after the flood, there is no other account of fallen angels taking human women as wives again in the rest of the Bible. John Fleming, uh, a 19th century theologian who wrote Fallen Angels and Heroes of Mythology, came to the same conclusion. And he wrote that the purpose of God 
in bringing on the world the flood was not merely to punish the transgressors, but to put a period on the unnatural intercourse of angels with the daughters of men. So, and this is the beauty of examining these old texts from centuries gone by and even millennia gone by, because they make it clear that this was their understanding, that he's commenting saying, yes, this destruction of the Assyrian and the angels who sinned took place to make sure this never happened again. It was a violation of God's genetic order. And so God did a punishment so devastating and cataclysmic, it would have a deterrent effect because these angels uh, who were punished, the Genesis 6 rebels who committed this fornication, they were taken from the human and heavenly realm immediately. They were brought down to the abyss and put under chains of darkness in the abusos or abyss or bottomless pit as it's referred to in the Greek. For millennia, where they remain today until the Great Tribulation. So this, of course, had a shockwave and a chilling effect to make sure this sin never occurred again. And there's an amazing passage in Psalm 29, actually, that makes a reference to this destruction. And in it, the psalmist is speaking directly to the angels and says, Give unto the Lord, ye mighty. That word mighty in Hebrew is giborim, a term used to refer to angels, Nephilim, Nimrod, anyone with a supernatural type of ability in fighting or an angelic being, they're called giborim. And it says that the voice of the Lord is on the waters. And then it makes this proclamation that God shouts his voice of judgment from the waters and exerts his power by using water, which, of course, the flood judgment was the ultimate demonstration of God's power through water. And as you continue to verses five and six, it says the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. So it's making a direct reference to this language that God broke the angels when he sent the flood. It says he made them skip like a calf and he divided the flames of fire. And so in the book of Hebrews, we're told that angels are also referred to as flames of fire. And how did God divide them? With the flood. Because all the angels who committed fornication, remember the devil didn't commit this sin. And, and, a whole, and a large faction of the angels did not commit this sin. But the Genesis 6 angels who did commit this fornication were immediately divided and taken down to the abyss where they remain today. Just an amazing passage. And so not only do we know the judgment of this king, this angelic king, the Assyrian, we also know the timing, the specific timing of his judgment. In Ezekiel 31, continuing in verse 15, we're told that God sent the Assyrian to hell, to the abyss, on the day the flood waters were, the day they were restrained, the day they abated. And so as the flood waters came and started destroying the Assyrian's kingdom, and he saw his Nephilim offspring die and his human subjects die, eventually, you know, and again, there was, of course, the windows of heaven opened from above, the fountains of the deep came forth, there was water from above and from the ground. And after 150 days, the waters were restrained. We see this in Genesis chapter 8. So this was the point that as those waters that came from the fountains of the deep were going back underground, God used a supernatural whirlpool effect to pull the fallen angels down into the abyss to judge them. And this is what God says. He says in Ezekiel 31, 15, he, in the day the flood waters were restrained, he brought the Assyrian to the nether parts of the earth, which of course is a reference to hell, Sheol, the grave, the bottomless pit. And Genesis 8 confirms that that after 150 days, that is when the waters were restrained. So why is that significant? I highlight in Judgment of the Nephilim that when you go to the book of Revelation to the end times, to spe specifically to the fifth trumpet in Revelation chapter 9, you see an angel falls from heaven, a star falls from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit where these angels are imprisoned. And that angel, who is the devil, opens the bottomless pit and these locusts emerge. They're called locust beings, but they're not insect locusts. They're hybrid beings. It says they have a face of a man, hair of a woman, teeth of lions, breastplates of iron. These are these grotesque hybrid beings. These are those same Genesis 6 rebels, the fallen angels who have been locked in the abyss. 
And now they're released, but now they're a tool of God's wrath because it says they torment men. All the unsaved men who don't have the mark of God. And the amazing connection here is that how long do they torment these men for? They sting them and torment them. And no one can, this is in those days, men shall seek death and not find it. And it says for five months. Well, on the Hebrew calendar, every month has 30 days. So it's for 150 days. So just as these angels in the days of Noah were tormented by the flood for 150 days, when they're released in the end times, in the great tribulation, they now torment the unbelieving world for 150 days. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. I mean, just powerful. You see through time how God is demonstrating his will and his way and that his word is true. So these same beings are going to be agents of God's wrath on the unbelieving world in the end times. And so in Judgment of the Nephilim, I go into great detail to really explain these concepts. And like I said, I'm often asked about this because this isn't a topic that's commonly discussed in church or a chapter that's commonly preached on. But when you look and just go verse by verse, you see that again, like Isaiah 14 and like Ezekiel 28, these aren't passages that could possibly refer to a king. This is a reference to another fallen angel who is not the devil. Because remember, the devil never went to hell. The devil can still access heaven. The devil told God in Job chapter 1, God says, where have you come, where have you come from? And, and the devil says, going to and fro upon the earth. And so he still has access. The devil does not reside in hell, but this angel and the Genesis 6 rebels, they are indeed in the nether parts of the earth. On that same note, there's an interesting passage in Job chapter 26 in the Septuagint, the oldest extant version of the Old Testament, translated from Paleo-Hebrew, that says, shall, shall giants, Rephaim, be under the earth? And it says, Abaddon has no covering. And of course, we see also that in Revelation chapter 9, again, at the fifth trumpet, there's an angel who's released, who's called Abaddon or Abaddon in Hebrew, also called Apollyon, who emerges at the fifth trumpet. So going back to Ezekiel 31, as it comes to a close, again, it just talks about the punishment of this prideful fallen angel, the Assyrian, and says that, God says, I made the nation shake at his fall. So this had global cataclysmic ramifications as the earth was destroyed by the flood. And it said that he descended to the pit with all the trees of Eden. So again, we see a reference that the angels who committed this sin were all taken down to the pit together in the flood waters when those waters returned to the nether parts of the earth, to the deep. So it's just amazing stuff. And the interesting thing is that when you look again at this passage in the Septuagint, it not only references the trees of Eden, the angels, it says also that the seed of the Assyrian, his seed, it says they that dwelt under his shadow, they perished in the midst of their life, which is what happened to the Nephilim. The Nephilim giants, they died in the flood. The angels survived. The angels were merely imprisoned. But the seed of the Assyrian, they perished in the midst of their life. And of course, that was the judgment of the Nephilim. Continuing on, the final verse in Ezekiel 31 says, To who art thou compared? And it says again that go with the trees of Eden into the depths of the earth. And it says this was the fate of Pharaoh, the Assyrian, this fallen angel. So just the amount of references showing you that we're talking about spirit realm, heavenly realm beings. God is driving home the point that this was not a reference to a normal mortal king. This was the judgment of this fallen angel known as the Assyrian in the Old Testament, who was the pre-flood antediluvian ruler in the days of Noah. Ezekiel 32 continues um, in the discussion of the Assyrian for the first 10 to 12 verses and actually talks about the Assyrian's return and makes a reference to the Assyrian returning again. And of course, in the final Nephilim, I go into detail about this because we see again that the fallen angels were imprisoned, all of them for this sin, but they are going to be released in the end time. So how will that play out? 
This is exactly what I discuss in the final Nephilim when these third sons of God, when the Assyrian returns, all these things will play out in the great tribulation. And if you think about this in terms of the days of Noah and the days of the coming of the son of man, look at the flood, the way the flood took place. You had the windows of heaven open and you had the abyss, the water, the fountains, the deep water from above water from below. And of course, in the end times, we're going to see the same thing. We're going to have angels in Revelation 12 who are kicked out of heaven when Satan is expelled from heaven by the archangel Michael, as well as the locust coming from the abyss, a repetition of the flood. This is what the end times have been saying at the prophecies for centuries, but now we have a chance to properly divide them and understand them. Because if you understand the beginning of the Bible, that is the key to understanding revelation. God has proclaimed in Isaiah 46, I've declared the beginning from the end and the final Nephilim. That is the theme of the whole book that when we identify when we identify the key events from early in the Bible, in antiquity, it will help us decipher and understand the mysteries of Revelation. In fact, in Ezekiel 32, it even makes a reference to the final judgment of the Assyrian. It says that when he's cast down to hell for the final time, that the giants will be there and will look at him and say, this was our king, this was the one who the world feared, and yet he will be judged by the righteous one, by the Messiah, the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. All will be fulfilled. And that's the good news. There's a lot of uh, tribulation and things that are going to happen um, that we read in Revelation that are scary, that are frightening. But the good news is that Christ has won the victory. It's already been declared. But we should know and understand the times, which is why uh, we need to study scripture and make sure we're aware and use this as a powerful witness to wake up others to the need for our redemption and our salvation. So thank you for joining me for this study. Again, for more information, you can go to judgmentofthenephilim.com. There are also links to our social media in this video's description. Like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and stay tuned because there's much more on the way. We're, we're going to continue this final Nephilim series with our next episode. On this same note, it's called The Veil. Why can't we see angels? We're going to explore what's going on in the angelic realm. What prevents us from seeing into the spirit realm? And why and when has God allowed certain people in history to see it? So stay tuned for more on that. Additionally, in addition to the final Nephilim, there is more on the way. So we have the final Nephilim book, which will be coming out in September of this year. In addition to that, we have two study guides, companion study guides for judgment of the Nephilim, as well as the final Nephilim. I'm well aware that there's a lot of research that goes into these books. I look at hundreds of sources from millennia to the most recent centuries, 17th, 18th, and 19th century theologians. And I know it's a lot of information. So I've been asked many times about making a study guide. Well, now it is here. So the companion study guides will be coming out as well. And there are two documentaries, Judgment of the Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World, as well as the final Nephilim, Battle for Heaven and Earth. Both these documentaries using a Hollywood cinematic production, narrated and starring yours truly, give a high-level overview of these books, these concepts, and of course have bonus commentary and content from me. Just trying to explore and make sure we get as deep into understanding the mysteries of the Bible as possible. The book of James says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh unto you. This is what we have to do as believers to learn, grow, and to explain the Bible. So much more to come. All those items will be available on the same day in September. So stay tuned. And be sure to tune in for our next episode on The Veil. Thank you very much, and may God bless you abundantly.